So I'll just start a very, you know, um, just a very uh, short uh, uh, welcome to uh, everyone for this uh, webinar um, with the uh, current situation um, going on. The first uh, thing is we really hope that, uh, you know, everything is uh, all uh, safe and all uh, good around you. Uh, it's going to be demanding time for people in uh, Europe now. I think in, in China, because I can see there's quite a few people from uh, China who've joined the session. Um, I think this is, uh, you know, starting to see uh, the end of the uh, tunnel and uh, starting to think in terms of recovery. But yeah, first message is really um, hoping that everybody's safe and that uh, we feel uh, secure and that uh, in control and that uh, you know we can uh, uh, put to good use the the time we've got uh, in front of us so really the idea was to um, you know just to anticipate um, a little bit some of the challenge we're going to be seeing coming ahead and and you know reacting a little bit to the situation getting back to some of the fundamentals um a lot of you have been uh, um, joining uh, um, someone saying they can't hear me. Um, am I the only, is it only Domin who can't hear me or other people? So apparently Yeah, apparently must, yeah, everybody can hear. So probably, I mean, you need to, to check something in terms of your uh, uh, access. Maybe Fred, you can pass uh, uh, a message to her. Okay. So, yeah, the, the idea was to, uh, well, spend a little bit of time to look at the existing situation and at the same time also to look into um, how to get uh, how to get ready you know for restarting supply chains uh, how to get uh, ready to uh, prepare for the uh, for the future um, I won't be spending much time you know talking about uh, EIPM we have a global footprint so that's been uh, uh, a privilege for me to be able to stay in contact with some of my uh, uh, former uh, executive MBA students in China over the past months. Um, it's been good to be, you know, in touch, trying to help when it was possible, but uh, just, you know, just in simple ways, just to maintain the uh, the personal contact, personal relationship. I think that's very important during these uh, these uh, this period uh, of time. Um, beyond this, um, I think what I've been hearing from people everywhere is, is the common feeling that we see every time we've got a major disruption uh, at economic level. You know, the, the first reaction is, so far, so good. We haven't heard of anything. Uh, why? Because a long supply chain, there's a typically a lot of uh, inventories there are uh, very often some some long lead time and in the present situation you know the uh, the virus outbreak to, took place uh, during the time of the uh, chinese new year and chinese new year is a period where a lot of companies are putting a bit more inventories on you know different side of the world in order to to prepare for the situation so it, it's it's a little bit like this you know everybody is scanning the ocean looking at the horizon and and for some time people say well so far so good you know we see the uh, the goods arriving in the factories we see in the uh, warehouses and at some point um, suddenly you know things are changing and and trouble is coming that's when we start to see the disruptions uh, in actions um, if we look at the overall uh, picture uh, this was something i've been doing i've been you know creating last week and and probably this week with what's happening in europe in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the confinement and everything you know the 
probably last week, uh, the uh, classic view was, well, probably we could still be in the best case scenario. But I think there's a, with the ongoing kind of uh, uh, reaction these days, uh, a lot of people would see, you know, more on the uh, worst case type of scenario um, on this element. So, so the best case scenario was really built on the idea that uh, China could be, you know, quickly recovering and there would be, you know, short term impact on, on services that would have been impacting the uh, global growth. But the other part of the world would have been anticipating things better and would have been able to, you know, attenuate some of the impact. Um, I think already this week we can we can see we can feel we're closer to the worst case, with global um, spread of you know the uh, epidemia, some ripple effect that will be slowing down recovery. As one part of the world is, you know, getting back on its feet, um, suddenly there will be um, a back uh, bullwhip effect. So uh, if had some in some part of the world, they, they can start to get access to parts, resources in order to rebuild the supply chain. On the other side, there will be some, some evolution of demand. In some cases, for some prog products, demand will go up very high. In other cases, demand will go down very quickly. So we will have, you know, from both sides, from the supply side, some, some challenge in terms of recovery. But also on the demand side, we will be seeing some, some major uh, fluctuation. And, and there could be some very, some non-linear uh, type of impact. Um, in some countries, we can still see a uh, a second peak in terms of the epidemia. Um, that has been the case in the past. So, you know, the, the number of cases are going down, but uh, there could be situations where uh, um, uh, a second peak, a, a second uh, development uh, of the disease is coming back. Uh, we've seen uh, over the past days uh, the impact on the uh, oil prices. It's not just due to the uh, epidemia, it's also due to some behaviors from some uh, countries and companies um, in order to you know, get advantage from the uh, current situations and geopolitical aspects. Um, we've also seen some major impact in terms of the uh, stock exchange. And uh, of course, if at some point uh, we start to see quite a few bankruptcies um, along the, the supply chain, the value chain, um, to a point this is something that can be compensated, but at a certain point in time, this can become, uh, you know, a non-linear effect and, and then, you know, it's, it's really big trouble and it takes more time to, to recover. So we need to be able to think in terms of um, a new normal that can contain both uh, on one hand, uh, you know, how to recover in a, as in a classic situation, but also, you know, be prepared, anticipate what could be even, you know, stronger impact coming from the demand or coming from uh, some disruption somewhere. Also, uh, one big thing that we need to, to look into into the future is how this will change behaviors, um, behaviors of uh, people in terms of holidays, in terms of behavior in public space, and how this will also change behaviors of, uh, of companies. So I think we are getting into um, not so much a world of known unknowns, but there will be some unknown unknowns. There will be some still some unexpected situation emerging. So the best thing is, okay, just to keep an eye, uh, 360 degree, uh, paying attention to weak signals, but making sure that, uh, well, you know, we are uh, ready and capable of addressing a different situation in a positive and in, let's say, relaxed, but in, a, you know, in, with serenity. This is a quote from um, one of my uh, alumni, Chinese uh, supply chain manager, uh, that, uh, you know, sent me a message last week. Uh, saying in our industry, few supplier's have gone bankrupt till now. Um, they 
you know, there's still some trouble and people are trying to uh, recover on the production. Um, some people are not in a position um, in some uh, companies. There are shortage of material. But they were saying that service industries, this is, you know, this is even more uh, challenging. They've got even more bigger trouble in terms of, you know, restaurants and, and places like that. So that's if you want um, the current situation apparently uh, in China. So a period like this is a period where we tend to activate um, business continuity plans. So whether your company has been on an ongoing basis preparing for a business continuity or whether, you know, this, this has been a bit more like a paper exercise and, and now you really need to make it into uh, practice. Um, this is a top management um, commitment activity where what you do is you bring together cross-functional team that can take very quick decision uh, across the business. So if there's a need to quickly requalify a supplier, you will have all the functions around the table that should be here, that should be able to support this. Uh, if there's a need to uh, make priorities in terms of clients, uh, same, you know, there should be on a daily basis, some people together, you know, looking at the main decisions that needs to be taken and taking this decision uh, as a team. During this period, the, the focus is very much on two aspects. Um, cash, um, we, we really easily understand that because some business are going to go low in terms of activities, because there will be delay in payments probably from, uh, from some clients, you know, this is the blood of the business. This is what is, you know, going to help keep everyone alive along the full supply chain. And it's important to look at, you know, any type of solution that can ensure you understand where cash issues could be coming from and potential bankruptcies could be emerging and how this could be supported, how this could be uh, resolved. Um, I don't know, I haven't heard so much about the uh, um, some of the supply chain finance. Um, I would expect to see some form of a, uh, you know, product that would be supporting, you know, suppliers who might be in difficult situation that some companies can activate uh, together with some banks. Also very important here will be, you know, the reaction from government in terms of uh, um, delaying some of the taxes, delaying some of the payment that some companies need to be making. Another big point of focus needs to be priority clients. Um, this is really a time where we need to understand uh, our client, which one we absolutely need to serve first and which one we might not be in a position to serve first and therefore to whom we should be talking um, with the right words to tell them that, well, currently um, there will be some delay in terms of delivery. So I think these are very important decisions and uh, being clear, transparent, being uh, um, and really taking decisions about who are our priority clients will be absolutely essential. And in reverse, it's really important to, you know, behave in a way where we should be positioning oneself as a good client that is worth being a priority client. Um, volumes, profit, um, what used to be gross uh, over the past months uh, is important here, but um, that's not the only element that can position a company as a priority client for their supplier. Then there will be, as part of the business continuity plans, there will be a lot done in terms of dynamic planning. So the um, SNOPs, all these processes, they will need to be reactivated very fast. And of course, um, a lot of it will be about managing uh, the uh, 
the uh, uh, will be about managing the consequences of some of the disruption and to anticipate some of the next challenge. And I think that that's very important. You know, the uh, the image that I always take is is the one of a chicken. Chicken are absolutely fantastic animals because one of the high can see short term and one of the high can see long, far away. So the uh, the, uh, I'll try to talk uh, closer to my uh, computer, but I don't think it's uh, it's really a, a problem of a uh, open microphone, Maggie, because uh, you're all on mute normally. Um, so yeah, the this image of the the chicken with one eye looking close and one eye looking far away. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to manage a cycle of reacting uh, to uh, short-term issues, but we need also to keep an eye on longer-term challenge that we might still need to be um, ready for. Points to uh, when uh, production is. Uh, um, is um, is broken when we face disruption special attention to uh, transportation capability you know this is the nerve of global supply chain so any kind of transportation capability you need to continue to be kept aware of what's available not available so for instance uh, last week in in china i understood that some people were switching to delivery by train instead of delivery by uh, uh, by uh, by some boat because some of the uh, some of the maritime time infrastructure were a bit clogged. I've heard this week that uh, some of the uh, arbor were, uh, um, you know, getting better. Um, this is evolving on an uh, ongoing basis. So it's really important to work with your logistics supplier to get some visibility, short term, mid term, slightly longer term on what are your options available. Um, one of the things that's very important to understand is really to look at the, uh, uh, the full value chain of some of the, the things you are buying and to be able to understand where they're coming from, um, especially for um, raw materials. I think you need to be able to quickly understand what type of raw materials are inside the product you buy and to be able to identify the source of these raw materials are coming from um, some of the uh, most uh, affected areas. So I think, you know, very often we have a tendency to segment what we, um, you know, like critical products, parts, supplier, um, that's, that's useful, but you also need to keep an eye on the deepest layer of your value chain. Uh, if there's shortage of raw material, if there's shortages of people in some regions, you know, then you might not see immediately some of the impact, but this is very important. So again, you need to find a balance between spending time to understand what is usually close to you, your critical parts, your critical suppliers, but also some of the things that are coming from further away some of these raw materials that might be coming from um, other parts of the, that have been uh, affected. Um, what we can do is we can circulate uh, a document that was published, um, I guess one or two years ago, um, that creates a description of raw material supply chains with the location. So that can be a first document that can be uh, of value here. The uh, next element that's important to take into consideration is uh, uh, potential bankruptcies. I've been talking about uh, this. I think we need to understand that the speed of recovery will be varying across sectors. So uh, uh, the uh, electronic industry was the first one to be highly impacted because of this just-in-time uh, capabilities, but they might be recovering faster than other industries, more service ones, you know, that will that will be impacted by confinement for longer time. So I think it's important also to have that in mind when you look at your uh, the product you source, you know, is to try to understand um, the speed of recovery across 
different uh, supply networks that you are relying on. And of course, you know, these bullwhip effects that will be happening. Um, you know the story of the bullwhip effect. Um, you know, people are placing more orders because they're afraid of uh, facing some shortages. And if this is happening in different parts of a supply chain, then, you know, suddenly the whole demand and offer is going very weird. So we are losing the, the logic of balance and we have these swings along the uh, demand and offer uh, along the full supply chain. So I think that's, you know, we need to be ready for that. Uh, it's a system effect. This is not something that we can combat alone. It's only the full chain that's able to restabilize at some point. Um, also, we all have access to information, to data, to some assets. I think it's important to always think, what is it that I have inside my company that could be of use to suppliers, to customers during this uh, uh, difficult time? You know, we've seen some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, companies offering uh, uh, services for uh, webinars and web conferencing, offering some uh, free plans during the period. So, in the same way, there might be stuff that you've been putting together. There might be uh, information sources that you can share with others that can help them to recover faster. And, you know, that also contribute to build your reputation as a good client in hard time. We talked about the point in terms of geographic locations and raw materials um, already. I'll have a, a picture after on this. And one thing that's important to have in mind is you still have opportunities even in our time. So maybe not yet now in, term, in, in Europe, but I, I can see in, in, you know, so through the contact I have in China. So when things are difficult for your competitors, you know, there might also be some, some opportunity to capture some, some benefit out of this. So I don't want to be cynical, but... Uh, you know, this will be a, a reality across business. So be a good client, be a good supplier, but don't lose sight of any opportunities that might be um, coming up around. Okay. So yeah, this slide is just here to illustrate, you know, some of the points I was uh, mentioning in terms of raw materials. Um, this is dating a little bit in terms of information, but you know, in in February, as soon as some of the raw materials, some of the uh, some of the uh, the issues started to 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 mount, uh, what we've seen is some of the uh, uh, raw material price going up. So this is clearly, you know, showing the extent of a uh, uh, disruption. And, and you know, just picking a picture from fast market, what you can see here is uh, the raw materials tend to come from one part of a, um, a country or another. And hence, you know, my comment of decompose your product, understand where things come, and, you know, try to... to uh, to see where is the source of some of these raw materials. That could be an important way to, you know, anticipate some of tomorrow's challenge. There's, there's a slide that I've been using on risk management for years, and I think it's still, you know, it's still very valid today. Um, when something is happening in terms of the disruption of a supply chain, time is really absolutely important. So when there is a problem, there is a certain time before you discover this problem. So this is where you want to have in place some system that allow you to get a better visibility on what is coming towards you. As soon as you discover a problem, then you start to understand the magnitude of a problem and you can take action to recover from this problem. So what you have here on this picture is company A who discover a certain problem um, at a time and then can quickly implement alternative source of supply, can quickly negotiate with a supplier 
uh, on how they can uh, establish continuity and the impact is totally different if they take too much time. So if company B is discovering the problem later and waits before reacting to it, for instance, and implementing some recovery action, then what you see is the impact is going up exponentially. Why? Well, because there is less and less uh, options available to um, recover from the situation. So that, that's really important to have, you know, these kind of things in mind. The first step is to be able to uh, capture signals so you can get access to, you know, short-term issues and longer-term issues that are going to be coming your way. And then having some team that can support, as I've described before, in a cross-functional way, any kind of action that's absolutely necessary to recover. The impact in terms of for two companies being exposed to the same problem, the impact can be absolutely drastic. Uh, years ago, uh, 20 years ago, there was a fire in one of the Philips semiconductor factory. Um, this has led, uh, at that time, Nokia will discover the problem very quick and recover the problem very quick to find solutions and have nearly no impact in terms of production and sales, while Ericsson's, that took a long time to discover and recover, uh, the, in a period where they were launching a new product, this has led to Ericsson closing its mobile phone uh, activity. Some examples of early warning indicators. Um, so for instance, early warning indicators, if you're thinking of uh, uh, if you're thinking, if you start to decompose your uh, your uh, uh, the product into uh, parts, materials, uh, then just looking at evolution of the price of some of the raw materials, uh, volatility can can give you a sense that maybe deep into your supply chain something wrong is happening. Uh, also, being able to um, ask. Uh, suppliers uh, in a certain period, what are the uh, what are the GPS coordinates of the main sub suppliers, for instance, of uh, their own supplier, and mapping that onto some information related to the uh, to the uh, um, to the uh, uh, virus outbreak can be uh, also a good way of building some early warning signal. I think in terms of the uh, of the uh, financial stability, you have some techniques in order to compute some information like Z-score. So you know you already you probably already have access to some financial information for your suppliers. I mean, this is going to be simple. Huh? If they were already low on cash, then it's going to get more. It's going to get fast into difficulties. So you know using data you have, using the what's available, if they were in a difficult situation a few months ago, or if they were not so high on cash, then this will be helping you to um, to anticipate some of these uh, elements. Maybe some, you know, some people from, from China have got a war part of the webinar. They also have some, you know, some kind of early warning signals they've been able to um, to implement um, to start to see when things are coming. Uh, working with, you know, transportation companies, some of them are offering, you know, quite a lot of services to give you real-time visibility on uh, different parts of the world and what's happening and, you know, things like that. So that could be, that could be also a good source of information. And someone has been asking if uh, the presentation will be shared about after the webinar. Yes, of course. Uh, I will also send you some some documents, some articles, you know, so you can you can have a look at some of these elements. So I don't know if this is answering for uh, percentage labor force capability could be early indicator. Yeah, I I mean I think my my. Uh, 
my experience, for instance, in, in China, um, some of my MBA students were already kind of uh, uh, monitoring number of shortage in the past in terms of a workforce. Um, why? Because they had quite a number of uh, mid-sized company that were relying a lot uh, during certain period of the year on uh, on people coming from uh, foreign countries to do some of the, the production. So so again, there, there might be sometimes it might be worse to go and to ask questions to suppliers, and but they will be limited in the ability to answer. Uh, but there might also be situation where actually, you know, the, the past is already giving you some good indication of what might be happening um, uh, tomorrow. Um, what's very important, I think, today in terms of uh, preparing and anticipating is also some of the uh, suppliers that are managing to recover to understand well their capability. You know, if you're thinking of mechanical products, what are they able to do in terms of types of products, what technology they have, um, you know, this, this could be a good way to anticipate some of the change you might be having. We are not systematic enough in purchasing. We only know what suppliers do for us. We don't know what they might also be doing. And in this type of situation, this is the kind of redundancy that would be uh, extremely useful. So that might be a good, you know, a good thing to um, gently start to build a good database of, you know, capabilities across your, your networks. Some years ago, when uh, there was a fire within the uh, Harley Davidson supply network, within, within a day, the other suppliers uh, were um, coming around and they all had some of the uh, some of the uh, production capacity, production equipment that were uh, helping to recover from the situation. So it's not just us, but sometimes it's also the other supplier that can help us in this type of situation. One thing that I find very important is relationships are key from a business point of view, but also from a, a people perspective. So don't give up, you're not alone, you matter. We've chosen this picture for announcing the webinar because I think that's, you know, very important to have in mind that uh, some people will be in high stress situation. Not always because of work, sometimes because of, uh, you know, family, the environment, the lack of news. Uh, yes, Samer, diversification across the value chain is important, redundancies. So, yeah, it's, it's really important also, I think, to be able to co communicate appropriately. Um, I've been in contact with some people, you know, who've been telling me that in their company, some of the management is rush rushing around and asking everyone to be on the bridge and, and they're activating 100 things at the same time. So, uh, without paying attention to people around, uh, suppliers, who they talk to, and what situation people are in. So I think I could, you know, it would be worth sharing with you a few advice in terms of when you talk to people in high stress communication. It's just that relationship matter, people matter, and it's not the same to talk to people who are facing high stress uh, situation. So high stress communication skills are key. When you are someone in a low stress uh, in a low stress situation, for you to be credible and to be seen as uh, a trustful source of information and to build a trustful relationship, most of the the fact the main factor is expertise and your competencies. Showing yourself as someone competent, uh, expert who can bring the right information at the right time, say, well, here I need to go back and get the right information. That's what builds, you know, trust uh, between people in a situation where um, there is low level of stress. But in a nice stress situation, this is only 15 to 20% of the factors that build the trust. In high stress situation, what build trust is listening, caring, showing empathy within the first 30 seconds of communication. 
So in companies where currently you have people in production working in the factory, all the offices are empty, and you still have top manage, some of the top managers coming down and uh, you know telling, keep going, keep going, it's important, just be very careful. You know, tell these people, pay attention to um, the level of stress among the people. They don't listen to what you say. You can't pass your key messages. So I stress communication principle. Be first. Don't let the rumors come on. Be credible. Listen as much as you speak. Show first you care. Express your concerns, your empathy, not just about work, but also about life of people ask questions. In high stress, in normal communication, people can remember up to seven messages. In high stress communication, it shouldn't be going beyond three. People don't understand more than three messages. Use visuals. People don't compute figures so well during high stress period. So a picture is much more useful uh, during this period uh, than, than figures. And don't try to of a reassure or sounds too confident. This, you know, this might decriminalize your 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 uh, uh, what your message. It means we need to be able to accept ambiguity and uncertainty. Two rules: um, key message, simple in emails, in communication, in verbal communication. Key message expressed in twenty-seven words, nine. Seconds, so and no more than three messages. So just, just uh, you know, be ready to have very sharp, simple, clear communication when people are in high stress communication. Um, three key questions: What should people know? What do they should care for? What do they need to know? Where should they go for credible information? What should they? do in order to make sure things are going fine. Again, you have a factory, you've got people working on production lines, you know, there are some issues. Who should they go for credible information about what to do, what not to do, you know, in terms of the uh, equipment around? Um, what they should know, that's absolutely essential, three messages. You know, just, just manage the communication in very specific, way there. So yesterday I've also been posting on LinkedIn something a bit longer with a few more templates in terms of high stress communication. Um, I think it's important. I think, you know, um, we need to take the time to pass the right message to the right people uh, in this in this period. And again, if, you know, people who've been uh, in China and who've been exposed to this situation, you know, don't hesitate to, uh, you know, to share some some of your elements. The, the person that has been working a lot academically on this is uh, Vincent Covello, who's running uh, the, uh, the Risk Communication Center in the U.S. Okay, um, I'm getting close to, to the end. And what I want to do is start to talk about after. So... We're in a stage where some of us are just getting ready to, you know, face existing challenges that are coming up. They're seeing the wave um, just uh, starting to reach them. And others, you know, are starting to pass the wave of troubles. They've gone back to work and they're starting to recover and put things back together. I think the, you know, We'll probably get out of this saying that we were not prepared enough, but I think we knew. We knew some of the uh, the degree of interconnectedness of our supply chain, and we knew what was necessary to try to um, suffer less from the impact of this uh, situation. What we might not have done enough is some of the actions that would help us to uh, become more resilient in terms of the supply network and the supply chain. There's there's a few principles here. Visibility, you know, being able to get visibility to tier one, tier two, sometime even further, getting access on a regular basis to 
the uh, early warning signals is absolutely essential. Flexibility, being able to um, quickly requalify a supplier, quickly requalify a product, being able to switch, change, being able to have um, more than one options in terms of you know, getting access to volume. This leads us to redundancy. Uh, when, um, if you are working for uh, an hospital, if you are working for uh, ambulance services, emergency services, you need to have much more capa capacity than uh, you need on an ongoing basis. Uh, because this is high risk environment, you need to be able to quickly mobilize new resources to, to do the job. So it's part of the way of handling this type of situation to have redundant means of uh, doing stuff. This can mean dual source. This can mean a lot of different things for us. This can mean, you know, paying a supplier just to be uh, ready to support us if needed. So they have tools, they have, and, you know, you pay a fee to make sure they're capable of supporting you uh, at a certain point in time. There are different ways of creating redundancy. And responsiveness. And responsiveness is when you discover a problem and you are getting into you know, the existing flexibility and redundancy doesn't cover it, um, how quick you can react to things. We can share the article about the resilient investment. Uh, but I think my expectation is we're going to be spending much more in terms of uh, building, uh, building some uh, visibility on the deep tier. Uh, looking more down the chain where things are coming from. Um, I think it's absolutely essential also here to push for some open data solutions, okay? I mean, I see companies trying to solve these problems alone. This is not working. We need to have collaboration across the full value chain in order to be able to share information that goes in an open repository. So we should be able to get visibility on some of these elements. There will be much more work to be. Uh, one of the very useful tool in order to get some, um, to get to understand the, uh, the situation is, and some companies have been using it, is the time to recovery studies. So this is a survey that you send to suppliers and um, you ask them if you would be facing a, a situation like this, what would be uh, of total disruption of your activity? What would be the time it would take you to recover from that situation? That's very useful. This was done, for instance, in Ericsson. You know, after the 20 years ago bad trouble they had, so they've been investing a lot in risk management. So they do time to re they they send this survey to suppliers. They ask them the GPS coordinate of sub suppliers and they ask them, um, you know, if there's a major issue like fire, what would be the time it would take you to recover in order to rebuild your supply network? By doing this, they don't try to just measure, you know, what is what is the uh, the magnitude of the risk and what would be the impact of the risk. What they focus on is, you know, how fast would it be? How fast would it be to uh, recover from a bad situation? So discover fast, recover fast, understand the ability of your supplier to recover. There will be a lot done in that direction. One of the biggest issue that really gets, um, that's really annoying is, okay, let's say you have a business and in that business, um, some people are decided to you know, launch new product and they have very optimistic and, and very stiff uh, ramp up of production. And then you depend there on the supplier who might be facing, you know, might have been facing um, high demand for other types of clients or things like this. And, and what happens is people in purchasing, procurement, supply chain, they see, they see the problem coming because the suppliers telling them we're getting into difficulties. We have, we might be having trouble to deliver uh, in the future, but it's difficult to go back to the people from sales to the product manager to tell them, you know what, you know the decision we've taken, you know there with the current supply chain we have, 
Today it's fine, but very soon we might be having a problem. So we end up being passing information from one place to another. And, and as long as the problem is not visible, it's not felt, well, people don't react to it. That's not abnormal. That's just human nature. So what to do? Well, in the future, we need to have integrated risk cockpit. We need to have uh, indicators, measures that build on what you already have in uh, your information system. Uh, plus few external data. Uh, we did a study with uh, an MBA student a few years ago where we were able to cover 30 major sources of risk with existing the data they had within SAP is in, in his company or public source of data. And then you need to build a, a risk cockpit where everyone in the company can have a view on what would be the impact of this risk on their activity. So in that company, the MBA student was able to use all the data in SAP and other source of data to give visibility to product manager. Ah, my biggest risk is an issue with these types of supplier because of, you know, high level of demands being required to them. So instead of keeping the information at procurement level to people who need to ring the bell, give cockpits that provide a hierarchy of requirement to the, uh, to, the, um, um, to the product managers and other people. We will see much more of this. And again, collaborative practice across you know, the value chain, creating some common data repository, anonymizing some of the data, but, but you know, make making sure that there will be some, some information that everyone will be able to get access to so we can understand what's happening across the full value chain. This is, a, this is what some economists are calling a common. It's like a common good that should be made available so um, we could be doing things better because alone we can't do too much. Okay, that's really what I had to share with you. Um, what I want is really... Um, just to stay open, this is what I can share from my knowledge, from the exchange I've had with a few people uh, over the past week. Um, this is still an academic perspective on it, but uh, uh, it's also leveraging some of the past project that we've been seeing. Uh, but please, you know, send me a message, tell me what's important. Uh, and I'm, you know, very happy to, you know, keep everything into a sort of a log and, and to share some information with you as uh, things are getting uh, uh, more challenging for some on some areas and other things are getting better. I think it's important to, you know, keep a, a learning spirit, a spirit of exchange uh, and keeping the social contact and, you know, just the human uh, interactions going on is absolutely important. So don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Uh, if you think I've missed a message and that you think I'm happy, send them to me. I will share them to, to the other. Um, don't want to sound like, you know, uh, this is the way forward. I think it's a collective work we need to be putting together. Any questions, any reactions, any point? As I said, we will be sharing the, uh, we will be doing a number of things. We will be sharing um, some articles. We will be sharing some, the slides. We will be sharing um, also the video. So we, what we've decided is uh, we've only recorded the, um, the presentation and my voice. So we will be doing one or two cuts and then uh, uh, we'll also be sharing the, uh, the video. So this can be shared. Thank you, Cedric, for the feedback. And if on the China side, Maggie, if uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but <clears throat> if you still have some of the uh, uh, alumni of the IPM over there uh, that want to have a, a short session, discuss, you know, pass me information from them. I can try to answer. If you want to organize something, 
I'll be happy to uh, to do something there. Um, you know, it's all it's it's good for everyone. Thank you, Samer. I hope things keep uh, you well in uh, Luxembourg. Okay. Thank you, Maya Santi. Thank you, Stefan. So, um, time to say goodbye. Uh, and, and again, you know, send me whatever you've got in mind. Send me messages. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of useful things for me that I can share back with uh, people um, at some point, whether on LinkedIn or through a future webinar or through just, you know, passing some information. Keep well, pay attention to, you know, yourself, family. Uh, you know, there's this picture of a uh, keep calm and still enjoy life. Um, I think that's uh, that's a good idea. The uh, I've seen that some of the uh, you know some of the apps for yoga are now uh, free for the next uh, three months. So uh, Don Dog is actually offering free yoga class online. So have a go with that. That's kind of fun. Thank you, Nancy. Bye bye. Take care of yourself. Okay, we're going to close.